It's 1949. I'm in Crawley in West Sussex. And there's been a murder. Today's true murder is another classic from the hefty annuals of crime. It was the case of the century that made all the headlines in the papers for weeks, no, months, and continues to pop up from time to time to remind us of the extremes that some people will go to to get rid of a body. For tonight's show starts with a disappearance, a suspicion, an arrest, and then the most extraordinary confession of all time. And yet there was no evidence, there was no body. At least, not what you might call a body. Just 28 pounds of oily yellow sludge. This is the macabre tale of Mr. John George Haig, the acid bath murderer. On the morning of the 19th of February, 1949, a lady, one Mrs. Olive Durand Deacon, failed to come down to the breakfast room in the hotel where she'd been staying for many years. This was very unlike the 69-year-old widow, as normally she was extremely punctual. Her friend, Mrs. Constance Lane, another residence of the Onslow Court Hotel, was slightly concerned and discovered that Mrs. Duran Deacon hadn't returned to the hotel that night. In fact, her bed hadn't been slept in. Now that was very peculiar, and certainly out of character. Even Mrs. Duran Deacon's newly found acquaintance, Mr. Haig, had remarked at her absence. Mrs. Constance Lane, however, didn't like Mr. Haig very much. The Onslow Court Hotel was a private residence along Queen's Gate here in South Kensington in London. It was uh, almost entirely inhabited by wealthy old ladies and it stood proud in this magnificent grand Georgian street. Hard to believe now on this beautiful winter's day that there also resided in this gleaming white hotel a cold-blooded killer. Mr John George Haig, very dapper, well-spoken, always immaculately turned out, at 39 was an extremely charming young man. Perhaps too charming. He had an appointment with Mrs Duran Deacon at the Army and Navy stores in Victoria Street at 2.30pm the previous day. He, being an engineer, had agreed to meet her and discuss further a project of Mrs. Duran Deacon's to manufacture false fingernails. He had a sample of plastic he wanted to show her at his workshop in Crawley in West Sussex. But unfortunately, she didn't show up. I'm in my car heading towards Crawley to Leopold Road where Haig had his workshop. Now, according to the AA route finder, the journey from South Kensington, London to Crawley in West Sussex using the old A roads from the, from the late 40s, it's about 32 miles and would have taken approximately an hour and a half back then. Um, assuming, of course, that is you don't stop. Of course, there was bound to be a perfectly sound and reasonable explanation for Mrs. Duran Deacon's sudden disappearance. But the following morning, on the 20th of February, Mrs. Constance Lane again noticed that her friend had not come down for breakfast and began to get very worried indeed. She told Mr. Haig that she was going to the police... Haig said it was the perfect thing to do and agreed to accompany her as he might be able to help. As indeed he might. 
Haig drove Mrs Lane to the Chelsea police station and there they both filled out the missing police forms. Haig described how he waited for Mrs Duran Deacon in Victoria Street and after an hour when she hadn't shown up, he drove down to his Crawley workshop alone. Four days later, on the 24th of February, Mrs Durand Deacon still hadn't surfaced and Policewoman Sergeant Lambourne arrived at the Onslow Court Hotel to get some extra statements from Mrs Lane and Mr Haig. They couldn't add very much more to their story, but there was something about Haig that Lambourne didn't like. She was an experienced police officer and she had a hunch that he was lying although she confessed she couldn't put her finger on it. She said in her official report, I have a sense that he is wrong. And she was right, for when they ran a research, they discovered he already had a file. It would seem our John George Haig had been imprisoned three times, twice for obtaining money by fraud and once for theft. Further inquiries revealed that he still owed a lot of money and he was in arrears with his bill at the Onslow Hotel. The police wanted to know exactly what Haig did at his workshop in Crawley and two officers from the Sussex Constabulary were sent to investigate. I'm in Leopold Road now looking to see if I can find the workshop myself and um, I can tell you the the situation here is very different. Where I um, imagine that the the fence and the uh, the yard and the, the brick hut would have been is actually now there's some very modern looking houses which look like they've been here for perhaps ten years or so. Um, it's difficult to know what was here prior to that. There's obviously in the last 55 years been a lot of changes. Um, fairly convinced that on my right or on the east of the uh, very short road that's only um, about two or three hundred yards in length uh, these two houses actually are probably where the gruesome murders took place and I reckon the garage and the hallway of this house here is probably where the original hut stood all those time ago now, when Sergeant Heslin and Appleton arrived here on Saturday the 26th of February, this is eight days after the reported disappearance, they were to find the workshop under the name of Hurstley Products. It was a small two-storey unit set aside in a yard away from the main engineering firm. Haig rented the workshop for a pittance, and only he had a set of keys. Sergeant Haslin was determined to have a look inside, and managed to prise the padlock off the door. Once they got inside, this simple brick-built shed looked ordinary enough with its whitewashed walls, pots of paint, simple workbenches, bits of wood and usual clutter. But to one side, on a work surface, they discovered a small hat box and leather briefcase. Inside the briefcase, the Sussex police officers found a variety of papers and documents, including ration books and clothing coupons. In the hat box, there were several passports, diaries, driving licences, even a marriage certificate and a chequebook. Curiously, none belonged to Haig. But the break-in and search suddenly became justified when the final item at the bottom of the hat box was removed. A point thirty-eight Enfield revolver and eight bullets. Haig was brought in for questioning at the Chelsea police station. It was the evening of the 27th and Haig appeared calm and unconcerned as he answered Detective Inspector Symes, Inspector Webb and Inspector Barrett's robust questions. The evidence had grown and the items found in the workshop were obviously stolen and some of Mrs Duran Deacon's jewellery had been traced to a dealer in Horsham who had confirmed Haig's distinct description. <laughs> 
I can see you know what you're talking about, mused Haig. And when asked directly where Mrs. Durand Deacon was, he thought for a moment and replied, It was a long story that involved blackmail and he would need to implicate many others. Just then the phone rang and Symes and Barrett were summoned from the room. Haig was left alone for a moment with Inspector Webb and he suddenly asked a curious question. Tell me frankly, he said, what are the chances of being released from Broadmoor? Inspector Webb immediately read Haig his rights, but Haig waved them aside and he said, If I told you the truth, you wouldn't believe it. Mrs. Gerund Deacon no longer exists. She's disappeared completely, and no trace will ever be found. I've destroyed her with acid. You will find the sludge that remains at Leopold Road. Every trace has gone. How can you prove a murder if there's no body? Of course, at first, Webb thought he was making it up. It sounded extremely doubtful. But with his question about Broadmoor, perhaps Mr Haig was setting himself up for an insanity plea. Cold-blooded murderers could hang, but the clinically insane would get locked up and possibly released. When the other two police officers arrived back in the interrogation room, Haig was asked to repeat his earlier statement. He continued to talk for a further two hours. Instead of failing to turn up as he'd first claimed, Mrs Durand Deacon had in fact met him at the Army and Navy store and Haig had persuaded her to come down to Crawley to the experimental workshop. Now, it was while she was examining some material, she had her back to Haig, that he picked up his .38 Enfield revolver and shot her in the back of the neck. She would most certainly have died instantly. The story then became a lot more gruesome. He further revealed that he had cut open her throat and filled a glass with her blood and drank it. He was talking calmly, drinking a cup of tea and smoking a cigarette. They could have been discussing cricket. Haig went on to reveal how he had removed all Mrs Durand Deacon's belongings, her fur coat and jewellery, and proceeded to put her body, fully clothed, into a special oil drum, one that resisted corrosive material. He had donned his protective rubber apron, put on his Wellington boots, gloves and gas mask. These had all been found in the premises, neatly stored away. I then filled up the tank with sulfuric acid by means of a stirrup pump and a carboy. I then left it to react, he confessed. And then he remembered something. Oh, I should have said that in between putting her in the tank and pumping in the acid, I went round to the ancient priors and had a cup of tea. I read another confession in which he revealed that it had taken him a good couple of hours to get the 14 stone frame of Mrs Durand Deacon head first into the tank and that when he came back from his cup of tea and poached eggs he discovered that he'd accidentally left, left the door to the workshop unlocked so that anyone could have discovered the killing he didn't like the term murder if they happened by. On the Monday after the killing, Haig returned to Leopold Road to see how the reaction was doing. Heat generated by the action of sulfuric acid on a body made the drum extremely hot and it had almost completely melted Mrs Durand Deacon's body into a horrid yellowy sludge. Haig skimmed off the top sludge and casually emptied it into some waste ground a little in front of the workshop within the fenced off yard. He then proceeded to pump further acid into the barrel to dissolve the remaining fat and bone. 
He then managed to pawn off and sell Mrs. Duran Deacon's fur coat and jewellery and pay off a few bills, including what he owed in rent, on this gruesome workshop. He returned back to the acid factory on Tuesday to find that the process was complete and the remaining greasy sludge was simply tipped away a few feet from the dismal brick hut. The confession had been bewildering in that Chelsea police station. The inspectors were flabbergasted at the frankness that Haig was telling them all this and the minute detail of each fact. So far it was just a story and the police were used to crackpots coming in and fessing up to notorious cases. But this was different. Haig was calm, relaxed and utterly detached from the horrors he was revealing. But if that wasn't gruesome enough, Haig had another couple of surprises up his sleeve to casually drop into the conversation. Mrs. Durand Deacon wasn't the only person he had dissolved in acid. There were more. In fact, five more victims had been killed and rendered into a fatty sludge. John George Haig was a killer, a cold-blooded, sadistic murderer with no feelings for the human condition. And yet, on the outside, he appeared as a perfectly normal, dapper little man, a perfect gentleman, dressed smartly at all times and not a hair out of place. This is Leopold Road. It's a quiet suburban street here in Crawley in West Sussex, just 30 odd miles south from London and a similar distance from Brighton and Worthing and the south coast. And immediately in front of me is a couple of modern houses. Now, they must be about 15 to 20 years old. Probably the owners are not aware that on this very site in 1949, one Mrs. Duran Deacon was lured here to Leopold Road, taken into what was then standing a two-storey workshop and senselessly murdered. She had come on the pretext of some scientific experiments that Haig wanted to show her for a project that she was interested in. But when they arrived, Haig shot Mrs. Durand Deacon, a 69-year-old spinster, in the head and dumped her body in a special oil drum he had purchased for the purpose. He made an incision in her neck and poured some of her fresh blood into a glass and drank it. He then proceeded to pump sulfuric acid into the drum and watched her body dissolve into a slimy, oily sludge. When Mrs. Duran Deacon failed to turn up for breakfast at the hotel where she lived the following day, her friend, Mrs. Constance Lane, reported the matter to the police. Haig was also staying at the Onslow Court Hotel in London and offered to go to the police with her, presumably to set up an alibi. But the police thought there was something fishy about Mr. John George Haig and started to look into his background. They discovered that he had already been in prison and decided to bring him in for further questioning here at the Chelsea Police Station. Haig had surprised all the policemen assigned to the case by confessing almost immediately. He was convinced that they couldn't convict him, however, because there was no body. He had dissolved it. So assured of his ability to walk away from this crime unscathed, he confessed that this was not the only killing he had committed. There were at least five more, and all had been dissolved in acid and turned to sludge. We now turn the clock back to 1944, some five years before Mrs. Duran Deacon had entered his life and long before he stayed at the now famous Onslow Court Hotel. His first victim, he said, was William Donald McSwan. Haig 
had a workshop in the basement flat of 79 Gloucester Road in London and had known McSwan for several years. McSwan was an amusement arcade owner and Haig had been employed by him for a while. They became great friends and enjoyed fast cars, London pubs and flashy clothes. Originally, Haig was taken on as a secretary and company chauffeur, but was soon promoted to manager. After a while, he left the amusement park to do other things. But as Haig was an engineer, he agreed to fix some of the broken equipment for McSwan. On the 9th of September, 1944, McSwan had come to Haig's basement workshop to get the dapper engineer to fix a pinball table. Haig confessed to the police quite happily that he'd hit this man over the head with a piece of lead piping. He then slits open his throat whilst he's unconscious and drank a glass full of his blood. He said that it took about five minutes or so for McSwan to die. And after he was certain that the corpse wasn't going to survive, he then left here overnight to decide what he's going to do. Now, remember, this was wartime Britain, and uh, the authorities had obviously a lot of other problems to consider and take care of, which gave Haig a lot of leeway. Now, he found an old oil drum on one of the nearby bomb sites, and he brought it back here to the workshop. There, he proceeded to place the body into a 40-gallon oil drum. Getting the body in was an ordeal, and he had to fold it up in half to stuff it inside, and it took well over half an hour to do so. Once in, he had to lift the drum to an upright position, and then packed McSwan's overcoat around him. He had already purchased a rubber apron and gloves, which he quickly put on and filled up a bucket with the acid. It was awkward, but he finally got the first bucket load of sulfuric acid into the drum. As the acid made contact with the flesh, it started to cause nasty fumes, and soon the whole workshop was engulfed. Haig had not expected this. He even had to step outside into Gloucester Road to grab some fresh air. Haig continued to add more acid into his makeshift bath, and it took several hours before the lifeless corpse of his old drinking buddy was covered with this bubbling chemical. The cold acid had become boiling hot, and there was not much more to be done that night, so Haig locked the door and left the process to complete. It was two days later when he returned to see the results of his experiment, the smell was awful as he entered the workshop. I'm surprised that no one actually complained from the block of flats here at Gloucester Road. Haig probably smiled a, a satisfied smile when he peered into the drum. All that was left was this blackish porridge smeared with red streaks. It had actually worked better than he expected, he admitted and had made the disposing of McSwan, or what was left of him, very convenient. Haig simply poured the sludge down a manhole in the basement. To account for McSwan's disappearance, he wrote to the dead man's parents, explaining that William had wanted to escape being called up for military service, and had fled to Scotland, and for safety's sake would communicate to them through his friend, Haig. This seemed to work for a short while, time enough for Haig to claim the power of attorney and dispose of McSwan's business assets, the pinball machines, and several properties. This ruse to McSwan's parents worked for a short while, but they, they must have got suspicious and eventually confronted Haig about it. But he wasn't too bothered. He killed them both and likewise dumped them in acid and unceremoniously poured away the oily remains. He again took a glassful of blood, or so he claimed, and proceeded to drink it. Incredibly, 
the disappearances of the McSwans were never linked to Haig, and the income from the properties ended up in the pocketbooks of the bookmakers. In fact, no one had even questioned their disappearance until Haig's confession that night in Chelsea Police Station in 1949. But the story wasn't over yet. The money was running out and Haig needed to get some more. He had stumbled upon a perfect method to kill, raise cash and dispose of the bodies. And there was no reason to suppose that he couldn't do it again. And again. In 1947, Haig met the Hendersons. Archie Henderson, 52, was a wealthy doctor and his wife, Rose, 41, a beautiful and attractive woman. Haig had spotted the Hendersons trying to sell their house and had offered more money than it was worth. He never had the money and the deal, of course, fell through. But it was a clever ruse into their lives and soon he was their friend. Haig was a patient fellow. His plan waited for five months before he could move it into a higher gear. He claimed to have charmed them, given them expensive gifts and even played the piano for them. They had money and Haig wanted it. On the 12th of February 1948, Haig drove Archie Henderson to Crawley to the newly acquired workshop that belonged to Hurstley Products. Haig was renting this grubby little storeroom to do his experiments. Haig shot Henderson in the head, actually with Henderson's own gun, which Haig had stolen earlier. He left the body and returned to Mrs Henderson and told her that her husband had suddenly been taken ill and needed her help. Rose was a little put out, but dutifully came with Haig to Crawley. Outside the storeroom, in the car, she fussed about having to go inside, but Haig insisted that he needed her to carry some of her husband's things. Reluctantly, she agreed and stepped into her doom. Rose was also shot in the head, and Haig trussed up both corpses and left them here overnight. A gunshot in a place like this would not really be noticed. The area was underdeveloped and the noise was not likely to be interpreted as gunfire. So Haig was safe so far. Again, Haig drank their blood. He returned and disposed of the bodies in his tried and tested method. Everything went as normal, except for one small detail. Mr Henderson's left foot hadn't quite dissolved. But Haig now, perhaps complacent or just under the theory that he was immune to capture, merely dumped the remaining appendage with the sludge in the corner of the yard adjacent to his workshop. Afterwards, Haig weaved his magic. He convinced relations that the Hendersons had left for South Africa. He sold their possessions and made money. Once more, he was flush. But it didn't last long. Gambling and bookmakers and living in the expensive Onslow Court Hotel depleted his funds and he started to get desperate. Enter Mrs Durand Deacon and his final arrest. Haig claimed to have killed a total of nine people, but of the other three there was no trace and their identity was never found and even Haig wasn't clear who they were, just people he had met and killed for their blood, or at least that was his story. So what was this all about, drinking the blood of his victims, wondered the police. They never really believed that this took place and thought Haig invented the vampire antics to support a case for being mad. Criminals on an insanity plea may not hang but end up in Broadmoor, the prison for the criminally insane and they suspected that Haig assumed that he would only be in there for five to ten years and then be out again, presumably to kill once more. <laughs> 
Haig claimed that he had dreams. He dreamt of a forest of trees, and as he got closer, he would be offered a cup of blood, and he would drink. Of course, it made the headlines in the newspapers, and he reveled in his newfound notoriety. The police had to prove that this incredible confession was truthful, and not just a pack of lies to put the authorities off the scent of Haig's real activities. Back in the yard, outside the workshop, the police forensic team searched and soon discovered a patch of oily sludge. Dr Keith Simpson, the eminent pathologist, headed the team and he discovered an unusual cherry stone-like object in the acid remains. Careful analysis then revealed that it was actually a gallbladder stone. The acid had not quite dissolved it. Also found were some fragments of human bone and even Henderson's left foot was discovered. This is the list that the forensic research team finally came up with. 28 pounds of human body fat, three gold stones, part of a left foot not quite eroded, 18 fragments of human bone, intact upper and lower dentures, the handle of a red plastic bag and a lipstick container. Now the the dentures were the most important find and thanks to Mrs Durand Deacon's dentist they were categorically confirmed as belonging to her. There was enough of the evidence that Haig had assumed had all been dissolved away which would finally have Haig bang to rights. On July the 18th 1949 Haig went on trial. He pleaded not guilty with a defence of insanity. It was a sensation with Haig actually writing a diary of events for publication in the News of the World. Haig was only tried for the murder of Mrs Duran Deacon, but the penalty by law was death by hanging, so the other murders were purely academic. It took only a total of 15 minutes for the jury to come to its decision. Haig was found guilty. Guilty. When asked if he had anything to say for himself, Haig simply said, Nothing at all. John George Haig was executed on the 6th of August 1949 at Wandsworth Prison in London. He may be dead, but his incredible story lingers on, and so does his legend The Acid Bath Murderer. (laughs) 